morning, everyone. Thank you, everybody, for attending the uh, G this GFC 500 webinar that we're being able to put on this morning. There's definitely some uh, unusual times going on around the country with uh, COVID-19, definitely a lot of uncertainty with the world and within general aviation itself, but glad that we're able to, to do this this morning and get some knowledge out there. Uh, my name is Matt Clark. I am an aviation pilot trainer here at Garmin. A couple of housekeeping items before we jump in. Uh, first two big ones, uh, we're not going to be talking about what aircraft are and are not on the AML, the approved model list, uh, as well as if, if you want your aircraft to be on the list, uh, we got a couple slides towards the end here that uh, we'll go into that, of where we can go and request that and where we can go find if our aircraft's on that list or not. Uh, but we're going to attack everything today from the pilot point of view from the from the GFC 500 here. Jumping in, as I said, my name is Matt Clark. I've been flying since I was nine years old. I am an active CFII. Granted, not as much right now with COVID. Uh, a lot of flight schools in the Kansas City area are shut down. Um, so we're waiting for some of that to, to kind of subside before we get back to Airborne. I did teach at the University of Central Missouri, taught there for about a year. Uh, beyond that, I've been teaching part-time over at ATD Flight Systems at the Kansas City Downtown Airport. Uh, I am a single and multi-engine rated pilot. As I said, I am a CFII, primary flying uh, Skyhawks, Warriors, Archers, Arrows. Uh, do fly a couple serious aircraft as well as the Piper Seminole Senecas for the for the multi-engine side of things there. Uh, Garmin-wise, I've been with Garmin now coming up on five years. I spent just shy of two years with our aviation product support team. So if anybody's called in in the past asking operation questions, usage questions, database questions, that is what we dealt. That's where I got my start with Garmin. Uh, my claim to fame, I took a call on the GPS 100, which is the first product Garmin ever made. My very next call was a Lear 75 G5000. So we got very good at jumping from one product to the next, from portables, panel mounts, uh, Gurma Pilot on the iPad. You name it, we supported it, we answered questions on it. So we bounced around from, from unit to unit very, very quickly. Beyond that, I've been with the training team for the remainder of that time for the last three years, where we teach everything from GTN, to TXI, G500, 600, G1, 2, 3, 5000. Uh, so we attack everything from the pilot side and, and try to get some of that knowledge over to, to you guys best we can. All right, we'll go ahead and jump in here. So for today, for the, about the next hour, we're going to be talking specifically on the GFC 500. We're going to go a little bit into the system components and the layout, what hardware can be, what we could expect into the panel. Uh, we'll go into different AFCS statuses and enunciations, what we're going to see on the G5, as well as uh, if we've got a third, another display such as a G3X or a TXI flight display what enunciations uh, we're going to be able to see on those displays. We'll go through an in-depth discussion of both the lateral modes and our vertical modes, uh, how we can use those, how we're using those in conjunction starting from takeoff all the way through flight. We're going to go into our electronic stability and protection. That's a big hot topic and a, a massive major feature for the GFC 500, uh, but we'll go into a deep dive on that. We'll go into a little bit of abnormal operations, what happens if something were to fail, what happens uh, if a piece of equipment goes, if, uh, anything like that. We're not going to be able to dive into every single abnormal, but we're going to cover the high-level stuff on, on that one. And then we're going to jump into a flight scenario. We'll start you off from the ground, how we can use the autopilot on the ground through our in route climb, takeoff. Uh, we'll do VNAV descents, regular descents, as well as approach. And then at the end, even the uh, coupled go around, which is a, a feature that I think a lot of autopilots don't necessarily bring to the table that we have the ability to do. Throughout this entire presentation, we uh, I do have a colleague with me here. He will be answering the questions box. So please, on the right-hand side on the GoToWebinar platform, uh, if you can use that questions, any questions that you guys do have, we will try to do our best to answer those. If we don't get a question answered for you today, uh, please email us. We've got a, a dedicated inbox set up. So if you go to aviationtraining.webinar at garmin.com. Any questions that you have, either from today or further down the road that you 
that come up, please email us. We want to get your questions answered. I don't want anybody flying around going, I, sh I should have asked a question or hey, due to time constraints, I wasn't able to get a question answered. Please email us, let us know, and we, we, we'll do our absolute best. We want to get an answer back to you. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner of every slide on this presentation will be that email address. So if you miss it here, it is on every slide. You haven't missed it. It'll, it will be there for the remainder of the presentation. All right. Well, that's enough about me. That's kind of the high-level beginning here. Let's jump in and start diving into the GFC 500. So first and foremost, we need a kind of a basic understanding of the system components and layouts. We're not going to go into super high level, but we are going to talk about what the equipment is needed, uh, potential system layouts and the potential equipment that you may have in your aircraft and how it's all going to kind of interface to each other. So first and foremost, we need the G5. The G5 flight instrument here is the AHAR source for the GFC 500. If we don't have a G5, we don't have a GFC 500. Uh, this does fit in that standard 38 cutout, big LCD display, it's got its own built-in GPS. Uh, big advantage, this is what we run in one of my flight schools, uh, we have the optional backup battery. So if we were to lose aircraft power, or, uh, your alternator power, generator power were to go out in the aircraft, this does supply another uh, an additional four hours of battery life. So realistically, that backup battery is probably going to last longer than the amount of gas you have remaining on the aircraft. That's that's kind of a reassuring thing. If we were to lose power, I've still got pitch and roll information. I know which way's up. So a phenomenal, phenomenal feature in this box. Uh, for those that are running a G3X, uh, G3X certified or G3X experimental, the G3X and the G5 can, both, can operate as the attitude source. So if you have a G3X installed in the aircraft, that can be your air AHAR source instead of the G5, or you can just run it as a G5. Either one work for you here. Uh, if you have both of these in the system and installed in the aircraft, then you'll actually see your flight director, the magenta bar, we'll get a closer up picture here in a little bit, uh, as well as your autopilot status. If your autopilot's on, if you're in heading mode, nav mode, you'll see that on both your G3X as well as the G5. Uh, so there's some redundancy there. Uh, your barrow bugs, your heading bugs, altitude bugs, airspeed bugs, all of those are going to cross flow from unit to unit. So if I change it on the G5, it'll update on the G3X. If I change on the G3X, you'll see it on the G5. Or if I use the mode controller, change any of my heading or altitude bugs there, I'll see it on both of my displays. So a lot of back and forth on it, a lot of redundant information there. So you've got in a sense, you're building in that cross-check. If you see it on one, you're going to see it on the other. A new piece of equipment that will be installed in the aircraft is the GMC-507. This is the autopilot controller. Uh, this is where we're going to be essentially commanding the autopilot, setting uh, heading altitude bugs, uh, engaging, dis, uh, disengaging the autopilot, selecting your different lateral and vertical modes, uh, all of this is going to be done from this GMC 507. So we're going to be referring back to this quite a bit throughout today. And then last part there is the GSA 28 Smart Servo. This is what's controlling this system uh, or controlling your your flight controls. Uh, so electronic torque and speed sensing, it's a brushless DC design, uh, also does not have a mechanical slip, slip clutch. So what does this mean for us in the long run? It means overall you're going to have improved performance compared to other servos and other autopilots that are out there. The big one that a lot of everybody on the uh, pilot side is really concerned about, it's got reduced maintenance costs. So it's going to be cheaper to run the autopilot long term, less maintenance is going to be required, pretty much better improvement, better maintenance control throughout the, the life of the autopilot. And if you've ever flown with any Garmin autopilot, whether it's a GFC 600 or that in the 1000, the GFC 700, we know it's a very smooth autopilot. It, it can it can dynamically adjust as it needs to, and it is it is a very smooth. It 
it flies just like you would expect a pilot to fly in a lot of cases better. So that's the basic, basic hardware. As we start getting into it, let's we'll talk about some of the layout. What we see here is the standard layout or the basic. You need at least a G5 as an attitude indicator. You're going to need the GMC 507, that mode controller, and you're going to have a pitch and you're going to have a roll servo. That's about as basic as this autopilot's going to get. You can uh, throw in the GMU-11, that is a magnetometer. A lot of times you're going to shove that either out in the uh, wingtip or up in the tail. Uh, if you're running a dual G5 setup, which I see a lot of aircraft run that dual G5 setup, then it will be required for the DG HSI option there. But if you're just running a single G5, this is an option. You can add a third servo for a pitch trim. So you have pitch, roll, you can do the pitch trim in there, which is going to allow for automatic pitch trimming. The system can automatically adjust the pitch trim as it needs to, to reduce strain and force on the control surfaces, as well as giving you the option of uh, having an, a manual electric trim. So you can now have the electric trim on your yoke and you can drive the electric, you can drive that pitch trim through there as well. If you really want, and this is going to depend on the aircraft, I'd, if you're thinking about having a yaw damper, it's going to help reduce those uh, yaw oscillations, maintain coordinated flight a little bit better. Some aircraft are going to need it, some are not. I would recommend talking to your installer on that one and having a discussion with them as to whether the yaw damper is going to be of value in your aircraft or not. If you're running any sort of nav, such as a GPS, in this case, the GNS series, the 430 or 530 watt series, uh, you will need the GAD29 Bravo. That is that box right in the center there. That is an interface box between your nav and the rest of the system. You can also link this to the GTN or GTN XI series. Still gonna run through that GAD29. Uh, the, addition, the, the advantage of having the GTN in the mix is it does bring in the Enhanced Descent VNAV, which we'll talk about a little bit later today. And you can also bring in a, another Garmin primary flight display, such as a G500 or a uh, G500 TXI. We've got a picture of the TXI display here. As we talked before, you are going to see those enunciations on the TXI or the G500 display, as well as the G5. All right, so very high level overview of what we're seeing equipment wise. So um, important to know what's in the aircraft. Now we're gonna start diving into what we're gonna see AFCS enunciation wise. Um, how do we know the autopilot's engaged? What modes are engaged? What modes are armed? It's important flying any autopilot that we have an understanding of what these modes are, what the colorations mean, and where the autopilot's trying to take us. We're going to take a look at the G5 throughout most of the day here. Uh, big thing you're going to see first and foremost in the center are the flight director command bars. Those are the magenta. Uh, if you see the or or the uh, give me the yellow bars, that's just the aircraft wings. But the uh, magenta bars on there are the flight director. Up at the top, you're going to see the mode enunciations. Anything. Uh, we'll get to it a little bit later, but anything green is an active mode. That's where the autopilot's taking us. So anytime we press a button on the mode controller, we're going to come back to the top of the G5 here, and we're going to verify what's active and what's armed. On the left side of the mode enunciations will be your lateral enunciation. So right now we can see that heading mode is active. And the center is your autopilot engagement. So here the AP is on, and for those aircraft that have a yaw damper, this that is the YD up there for yaw damper. On the right-hand side is the vertical mode engagement. Uh, if you do VNAV, you're doing IAS for climb, vertical speeds, descents, VNAV, any of those modes and unstations are going to show there. Uh, currently, we're showing that the aircraft is an altitude hold at 3,000. So all it's going to do is maintain 3,000. Standard Garmin Logic Force here, anything that is green, you see green, that is an active mode. That is where the autopilot is currently taking you. Um, 
Notice how I've got a picture of a G500 up at the top. Uh, below it is the G500, G600 TXI. Same mode, same enunciation, same layout. Uh, G3X is the only one that goes a little bit different for us. Uh, notice how on G3X, our lateral mode is in the middle. Our autopilot engagement's on the left. Our altitudes are still on the right versus every other display, such as the G5 down at the bottom, uh, G500, 600 TXI, or G500, 600. The autopilot's in the center. Your lateral mode's on the left. Your altitudes are on the right. So G3X is the only one that's going to differ just a little bit. So as we said, green is your active mode. That's where the autopilot's taking you. White is an armed mode. It's waiting for us to get to it, such as I take a look at the G3X. Vertical speed mode is active, and I've got ALTS, or altitude target select. That is white, meaning I've set an altitude bug on my auto, or on the GMC or through my primary flight display, and we're either in a climb or a descent, and it's waiting for you to get to that selected altitude. Or if I take a look down here at the G5, we're on a heading mode, and I've got GPS armed, meaning we're waiting to get to the GPS course, and then it can take over, and heading mode will drop off. So white, or excuse me, green is always active. White is always your armed mode. And then if you see anything with a yellow, uh, Typically, that means something's disengaged. So if you press the autopilot to disconnect on the yoke or you hit the AP button on the GMC 507, you'll see the AP flash at you. That's the caution that the autopilot is no longer on. Uh, if you change, you manually change a CDI source, you're on magenta needles and you change over to green needles so or to VLOC. The mode, if you're tracking that nav course, the mode will drop because the autopilot doesn't know what you intend. It was tracking GPS and now it's not, or and vice versa. So you'll see the same thing happen mode-wise for your lateral modes. But it's just a caution to us. Before I go back, one thing I do um, like to point out, and anytime I talk autopilot, is you always verify your active and your armed modes. Anytime we press a button, anytime we change a heading bug, we change an altitude bug, we want to verify it. You press a button. You verify. You're going to hear me refer to that and say that over and over throughout this presentation. Uh, I referenced a CJ4 crash that was up in Cleveland a number of years ago. Uh, the pilot took off out of there, was trained the moment he got off the ground, he was going to engage the autopilot, press the button to turn the autopilot on, but never verified that the autopilot was actually engaged. So whether he didn't press the button well enough, uh, I don't know the full details on that one. But wind up blowing through an altitude constraint, blow through speed constraints, air traffic control yelled at them. Um, oh, autopilot was not on, pilot was not flying the aircraft. So at one point the aircraft was reported as a six, uh, I want to say 60 degrees of bank and 40 degrees nose low before the aircraft impacted the ground. Unfortunately, this is an accident. This is a, it's a great case study, but it's a horrible accident that very easily could have been prevented. Had he pressed the button on the mode controller and then verified what the autopilot was doing. So going forward, any and this this applies any arm uh, any autopilot out there, whether it's Garmin or third party. When you press a button on the controller, verify what the aircraft, what the autopilot's doing. If the autopilot is doing something you don't want it to do, disconnect the autopilot and hand fly the aircraft until you can figure out what modes or what you need to do to get the autopilot re-engaged. Never let an autopilot take you somewhere you don't want it to. All right, well, we're going to dive in a little bit more into the different sections on the controller and what they mean for us. So the first and foremost, we're looking at the GMC 507. We're looking at the autopilot engagement section. We have a number, we have four options in there. First and foremost, the one we're going to be hitting quite a bit is the autopilot button, the AP button. When you hit the AP button, it is automatically going to turn your flight director on, and it's going to automatically turn the yaw damper on. If we didn't have the, uh, the flight director already on, you're going to put you into a roll, which essentially keeps your wings level, and it's going to put you into a pitch mode, just maintaining the current aircraft pitch. Generally speaking, running a Garmin autopilot, if you see roll and pitch, 
more than likely you're in a wrong mode. And we'll talk about that when we get more into the uh, lateral and vertical modes, but those are the default modes. The flight director button, the FD button down underneath, is to turn the flight director on. You can turn the flight director on independently of the autopilot. So if you turn the flight director on, you're still gonna run your lateral and vertical modes the same, but now you're still hand flying the aircraft. So if you're doing that approach, you want a hand flight, but you want the additional guidance of the flight director, then by all means, turn the flight director on to keep the autopilot off. Uh, yaw damper, just like the flight director, can be turned on independently. Uh, some air aircraft, you get, you start taking off, you'll turn the yaw damper on, get a little higher altitude, then you turn the autopilot on. You can turn them on independently. The last button up there is the level button, the big blue level button. When I'm teaching my instrument students, especially the first time we go into hard IMC, they go into IMC and they're struggling to figure out which way's up, which way's down, am I turning? They start fixating, they get spatial disorientation. Well, this could be a case for us. We come in, we don't know what the aircraft's doing, we're getting disoriented. Well, let's get the aircraft back to level flight. Let's get ourselves back to a stable platform before making any big adjustments. So this is a button that can definitely help us. If we start experiencing that spatial disorientation, um, we can simply press the level button. The advantage of this button is, regardless if the autopilot is on or off, if, if the autopilot is off and I press that level button, the autopilot will automatically engage. It's automatically gonna bring my wings down to uh, zero, bank angle, and it's going to set me to a zero vertical speed. So it's going to level the aircraft for us. A great, great safety feature there for us. Now this is a better picture of, or another way to tell if the autopilot is on or off and if the flight director is on and off. So these are two different pictures showing the flight director. The top picture, we notice how the flight director, the magenta command bars, they are hollow. This is this is a big clue for me. Um, no enunciation wise up at the top, I would see the AP is not on, but I would see this here. I'd see the, the command bars up. I see the hollow command bars telling me the flight director's active. The autopilot is not. Versus the bottom picture, the flight director command bars are fully filled in. When they're fully filled in, that means the servos are engaged. The autopilot is on. So this is an, an additional cross check for us, as well as the mode enunciations at the top of the G5. All right, laterally on the left-hand side of the GMC 507, you're gonna see uh, all the different lateral modes that we're capable of using. Uh, we're gonna start with the heading and track knob guy right there. The heading track that is going to set your heading or your track. I'm going to go into here in just a second the difference between heading and track. Um, essentially heading is going to follow your heading bug. Whatever that blue bug we set on the G5, whatever we turn that to, that's what the autopilot is going to fly. Versus track is going to follow a GPS ground track. You can use the two if you need to. Uh, if you have the magnetometer, more than likely you're going to use heading mode. ATC gives you a heading to fly. Go to heading, set the heading bug. If you don't, if you don't have a magnetometer at all, the heading option is not going to work for you, in which case you're going to use track. And it's just holding a GPS ground track. But both of those are going to be controlled through the heading knob itself. And then you can always press the knob in, and that will sync your heading or your track to your current heading or track. So that's a quick, quick shortcut for us. The other two buttons you're gonna see are the nav and approach. Nav button, when you press that, it if your CDI is left, less than a half scale deflection, it's gonna track whatever our current CDI is set to. So if we're tracking a VOR or tracking a localizer, when I press nav, it's gonna track that VOR or localizer and give us the appropriate enunciation. So if we're on a VOR, I hit nav, I would expect to see VOR as my green enunciation. If I'm tracking a localizer, I'd expect to see LOC or LOC. And then for GPS, if we're following GPS course guidance and I'm running magenta needles, I press the nav and it's gonna show GPS. And then approach. Uh, typically, 
when uh, ATC tells me that I'm cleared for an approach and prior to any sort of glide path, a glide slope intercept, I'm going to arm approach mode. Uh, that's what we're going to need to follow those appropriate courses. And we'll get a little bit more into that here into the scenario. Now here's the difference here between the heading mode and track. The top picture up there, I'm in a heading mode. Notice how it's a white, uh, it's white numbers. White means that's I've got the heading information, I've got the magnetometer on the aircraft. We're following a heading, and it's going to follow that blue bug right there. Versus track. If I switch and go into track mode, hit the TRK button. Oop, I too far. It's now showing me magenta. It's got a magenta number. So magenta meaning it is GPS based. It's holding a ground track. Nice thing with a ground track is it is holding track. It doesn't care what the aircraft heading is. It is taken into account when correction. All it wants to do is follow that consistent ground track across the ground. All right, vertically mode wise, uh, we're gonna start up. We have on the left side of the vertical mode section, we do have the up and down wheel. That wheel is going to help us adjust our aircraft pitch. If we set a climb pitch or a descent pitch, uh, we can use that mode to change, or that wheel to change our indicated airspeed, bug and reference, as well as our vertical speed. So if I pressed one of those options, I can then use that to fine tune. So for example, if I go into IAS, IAS, when I simply press the button, that is going to capture whatever I am currently climbing or descending at. I personally like to use IAS as a, for my climb. I can set a specific climb airspeed. Uh, so one of the aircraft I fly, I've got a rotate speed and a VY, maybe 100, 110, but I've got a en route climb speed of 130. So I can set IAS, I can get to VY once I'm high enough up. I can use that up and down wheel to select, in this case, I'd go for 130. And now I've got my cruise climb set. I don't have to change modes. So I can use that to adjust and fine tune that speed. Same thing is going to apply for vertical speed, for VS. I set my VS, it's going to capture whatever vertical speed I'm currently doing, and then I can use that up and down wheel and I can adjust my vertical speed rate by in 100 feet per minute increments. So if I was doing 500 feet per minute down and I hit vertical speed, it's going to capture that. And if I wanted to come down a little faster, then I'm going to use the wheel and I'm going to set whatever speed I wanted to send at. Now, I like using IS for a climb, I like to use VS for a descent, but you can use them in either way. But those are typically how I like to use both modes. The VNAV button is going to allow for pre-programmed descents, such as uh, descend via as if you have an arrival, or if you manually create a VNAV descent through the GTN or GTNXI, then we will arm VNAV to allow the autopilot to couple to that vertical nav path. This does require a GTN with uh, software version 651 or higher, or a GTN XI. Uh, we're gonna get a little bit more into VNAV and what we should be doing when we get to the scenario. I'm not gonna go in on how to create the VNAV profile. I do have uh, another seminar, a couple another webinar coming up on how to create a VNAV profile. So we'll talk about that later. The altitude bug, or the altitude uh, button here is the last one there we don't really haven't talked about yet. That is, if I press that button, it is going to capture my current altitude. If I use the up and down wheel, I can fine tune that altitude, uh, plus or minus 200 feet, but it's just going to capture my current altitude. Typically, if I'm climbing though, I'm going to use my altitude select uh, knob there, and I'm going to roll that up or roll it down to the desired altitude, and then I'll use it in conjunction with either IAS or vertical speed to climb or descend. And the advantage of pre-selecting that altitude is once the aircraft reaches it, it will automatically go into altitude hold. I don't have to press the altitude button. And then same thing as the heading and track. If I press the knob in, it's going to automatically sync to my current altitude. So a very quick way of getting, getting that bug reset if we need it. And typically for heading and altitude, we're going to use the two knobs on the GMC 507. But for those running GMC or the G5 or 
even the case of the G3X or TXI G500, you do have some other options. Uh, in the case of the G5 specifically, if I press the knob on the G5N, I get the little sub-menu, and here I can reset and change my heading, or I can set an altitude bug from here as well. Either way is going to work for you. The e, I think the easier, faster way is going to be doing it through the 507, but you do have another redundant way to set those bugs if you need it. All right, so let's go into a little bit of our electronic stability and protection, or what we call ESP. No, we're not reading your mind, but we're trying to keep you in a safe and protected envelope. Uh, it's going to correct for bank, for pitch, and airspeed exceedances, um, and it's going to try to keep us back in that safe envelope. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit more here, the, the bank protection, pitch protection, as well as some airspeed. This is a feature that is automatically armed above 500 AGO. We don't want the ESP trying to kick in when you're below or real low to the ground. Um, and as we come in on a descent, it's going to automatically disarm below 200 feet AGL. Last thing we want is we're going in or we're getting into the flare. And last thing we want is the servos trying to drive the nose down. That would be a little counterproductive for us there. So it does auto arm and it does the auto disarm. We'll talk about uh, here in just a little bit how we can turn it on, turn it off, or override it. But we'll talk about that here in a bit. For our bank protection, typically the autopilot is trying to discourage us beyond uh, banking beyond 45 degrees of bank. On the picture to the left, notice how on the G5 I've got a double green hash mark. So when the autopilot is off, I'm hand flying the aircraft, I'm going to see that double mark. As soon as I turn the autopilot on, those marks are going to go ahead and disappear from the screen. So what will happen is I start rolling the aircraft, I roll past 45 degrees of bank. So in the case here, you'll notice the yellow line, or there, the green, those green hash marks are going to move up. They're going to move to 30 degrees, and they're going to go to yellow. So now the, uh, the servos are going to engage, and they're going to try to get us back in within 30 degrees. So we've gone to 45. We've rolled past it manually. The system's trying to roll us back within less than 30. The further you go past that 45 degree mark, the more aggressive the servos are going to engage. This does have a limit though. Uh, if you go past 75 degrees of bank, the autopilot, the servos are going to disengage, you're kind of on your own. So it's not going to handle if you go um, inverted or anything massively aggressive like that, but it is going to keep us in the, try to do its best to keep us in that safe, protected envelope. Pitch engagement is the same sort of thing. Uh, we're trying to discourage between pitching up or pitching down too far. Now, unlike the roll, the roll is pretty standard at 45 degrees of bank. The pitch is going to vary from airframe to airframe. Um, so, an important one here, anybody that is going to be flying the uh, GFC 500, some of the required reading is going to be taking a look at the Aircraft Flight Manual Supplement, the AFMS. This is going to tell you what those pitch limits are. So they're going to vary whether it's a Piper Warrior versus a 210 versus a G33. They're, they're, it's all going to vary. So, so pay attention, take the time, read through the AFMS, and know when those are going to increase or know what those limits are. Just like the roll protection. The further I pitch up or pitch down away from the set reference, the more the servos are going to fight against me. Whole idea, we're keeping the aircraft in a safe and protected envelope while we're hand flying the aircraft. Now we do go one step further as well. If you're in one of those ESP, whether it's bank or it's pitch for too long, in this case, if you're there for 10 seconds within a 20 second time period, the autopilot is automatically going to engage. You'll get an oral alert that the autopilot is engaging, and it'll automatically put you into level mode. It doesn't know what's happened. It assumes something went wrong, so it's going to command the aircraft back into level flight. This is a feature. Level mode via ESP will automatically arm above 2,000 AGL, and it's going to automatically disarm below 1500 AGL through descent. So if you get lower to the ground, then it will disable itself so, you're not so it's not trying to fight you. But anything above that, 
if you if you're in that uh, protected area for too long or outside of the protected area for too long it will engage the level mode now the uh, high speed and low speed protection these are more features when the autopilot's on so high speed we're trying to keep you from going past v and e and then low speed protection we're trying to prevent you from essentially we're trying to keep you from stalling it's going to uh, keep you from going below a set airspeed uh, for both of these we do require a garmin pfd and or a gtn with a valid terrain database so for all these modes that for automatically arming and disarming we've got to have something to reference off of that's the terrain database for the high and low speed protection this is always going to inhibit below 200 feet agl so as you get into the into the landing flare there's no worries that the autopilot is going to try to drive the nose down uh, it is automatically going to disable for the overspeed, as we said, this is going to work when the autopilot's on in certain modes, climbing and descending. Uh, if we go too fast, it is going to automatically start pitching the nose up. It doesn't want to exceed the maximum airspeed or the maximum airframe airspeed. You'll get a max speed alert on your G5 and your vertical mode, whatever we could be in a vertical speed descent, uh, it will automatically change into IAS, indicated airspeed, meaning it's going to now raise the nose up, usually a, a, a knot or two above, or excuse me, below V and E, and it's gonna maintain that airspeed until we've done something. We reduced power or the aircraft slowed down enough. The previous mode is still armed, so once we get the aircraft slowed down, the previous mode can take back over and continue with that descent again. Same thing's gonna happen for under speed protection, or USP. Uh, same thing, if the autopilot's on, we're gonna discourage operation below an established airspeed. Once again, this is gonna vary from airframe to airframe. Take a look at the aircraft flight manual supplement for those airspeeds there. Uh, but we're gonna get the same alert. I got a min speed alert this time, and if we're going too slow, and it's gonna do the opposite of the overspeed. If we start getting too slow, it's gonna start pitching the nose down. It wants to keep air, air flow going over the wings. Same as overspeed protection, we're gonna go into an IAS mode. So it's gonna set a, a speed that's a couple knots faster than that specified stall speed. We're gonna get an airspeed alert again if the altitude starts becoming critical. Same thing as the overspeed protection. Once we get the airspeed back into a proper mode, IAS, indicated airspeed, can drop off and our previous mode can pick back up. So big high level stuff. For pitch and roll protection, the autopilot is not engaged and we're keeping the aircraft in that, and in, we'll engage if the aircraft's in the uh, proper engagement envelope. So if you're doing any sort of crazy maneuvering, uh, we may out, be outside of the normal a autopilot engagement zone, so it may not be able to take in to pay attention to the AFMS on that one. For underspeed and overspeed protection, this is for the autopilot is engaged, we're at least at a GPS altitude greater than 200 feet. And once again, we're in the autopilot engagement envelope. Now I know there's gonna be some out there. Okay, we're, this is a training aircraft or I'm getting ready, I wanna do some maneuvers or I don't wanna worry about ESP turning on. We do have ways around it. Uh, for instance here, if, if I'm doing a commercial standard steep turn, we know that goes to 50 degrees of bank. Obviously, if I go past 45, ESP is going to kick in. I need some way to override it. So in the case of the 500 here, if I press and hold the autopilot disconnect, I can press and hold on the yoke, I can roll past 45 degrees of bank, and ESP, the servos, are not going to engage. The moment I let up, however, if I'm past 45, I will feel the servos engage and start trying to drive me back within 30 degrees. But this is a temporary measure. I still want ESP, but I'm purposely doing something that I know I'm going to go past standard ESP envelope, so press and hold the button. I can also turn it off a little bit more permanently. If I press the knob on the G5, I can roll that knob over to, I'll have an ESP box, and I can press that knob to disable ESP. So now for the rest of that flight, ESP will not engage for me at all. So there's two ways we can do it, uh, temporary or the more permanent, yeah, the ESP disable. For those running G3X, 
same thing. I hold the AP disconnect, that's still the temporary, but this time on G3X, if I tap the autopilot status box, it'll bring up a whole sub uh, whole window for me for the AFCS, and that's where I can control the autopilot directly from the display, as well as the GMC 507, and I'll have an ESP button that I can press to turn ESP on or off, just like we did on the G5. All right, a couple abnormal operations, then we're gonna jump into a flight scenario here. Uh, so, basic one here, if you see anything, flash. Uh, in this case here, notice how GPS is yellow. It means I manually changed my CDI source. I went from magenta needles to green needles, uh, GPS to VLOC. The mode will drop and you'll see it flash yellow. That's a sign. So that's that's just a, a caution for us there. Same thing if I press the AP disconnect or I hit the AP button on the autopilot controller, I'll see the AP button or AP start flashing at me. Notice how if I hit AP, in this case, the AP button on the autopilot, notice how my flight director went hollow again. So it means the flight director is still active, but the autopilot is not on. The servos are not engaged. If you see a red AP, red AP in the center there, that means we had an abnormal disconnect. Something went wrong in the system, whether a servo failed, whether a piece of equipment failed, something happened on board the aircraft, and it's it's going to flash. It's going to tell us, hey, do not use me, something's wrong. And it's going to continue to flash at you until you acknowledge it. You're going to get an oral alert. And, so what we'll need to do at that point is either hit the AP button on the controller or we're going to need to hit the AP disconnect to acknowledge that, yes, I understand the autopilot's failed. Other general malfunctions, if I see a red AFCS, means the autopilot's failed as well as the flight director. The flight director's gone. So something, something catastrophic happened on board the aircraft. We need to know that we need to hand fly the, air, the, the aircraft at this point. Uh, if I do see a, uh, or a yellow AP with a red X, that means the autopilot's failed, but the flight director itself is still available. So something's happened, whether a servo happened, something happened in the system, but the flight director's still able to provide us guidance. A couple overall warnings that we have, and these are straight out of the aircraft flight manual supplements. Uh, tr don't try to overpower the, uh, the autopilot. This can create massive out of uh, out about our opposing trim forces. So when we do disconnect, now we're gonna have to massively retrim the aircraft. Um, and then the same thing, don't attempt to re-engage an autopilot if, or use the manual, manual electric trim until the cause of the malfunction has been corrected. Generally speaking, grab the controls firmly, disconnect the autopilot, whether it's through AP disconnect, pressing the 507, or if need be pulling a shirk breaker. If you have an issue of a massive failure in flight, don't probably best bet, don't re-engage it. Fly the aircraft, get it on the ground. Now we can start troubleshooting it when we're safe. All right, now we're gonna get up. We've got a little bit of a flight scenario here. We're gonna start from the aircraft on the ground through takeoff, en route, via vertical nav descent, vertical speed descent, approach, couple to go around a whole flight scenario of what this autopilot is capable and what it, this thing is bringing us. So for the example we're going to use today, we're going to go from New Century KIXD over to the Napoleon VOR ANX Alpha November X-ray for the Kayla 3 arrival into St. Louis. Quick, easy flight, but a flight that we can use all the features of this autopilot. For the, term, for the purpose of this scenario, we're using a single G5, I'm using the GMC 507, and we're going to be using a GTN 750X as my navigator, so we do have the, the, G, the VNAV capability. So we're going to start, we're on the ground at New Century, and we get to the instruction, on departure, fly a runway heading, climb and maintain 3000, runway 18, cleared for takeoff. Standard departure clearance, nothing crazy for us. So pilot action. I'm going to take uh, my heading knob, or I can use the knob on the GMC5 or the G5, and we're going to set our heading. So they said runway heading. I'm going to set it to 180. I'm then going to set my altitude. You take that altitude knob, 
set 3000 on the uh, G5. And this is a fun one. If I have a toga button or take off go around, I can press take off or press toga and it's going to automatically turn the flight director on. I'm going to verify that I've got ALTS, meaning altitude target select, meaning the, once I get to 3000, the aircraft will automatically level me out. And I'm going to verify my AFCS status. I'm going to verify that I've got takeoff and takeoff. What that mode is telling me is it's going to keep my wings level and it's going to set a climb pitch for the aircraft. It does that automatically for me. That climb pitch is set per the AFMS. So we get the aircraft rolling. So we add power, we start our climb out, we're still hand flying. Above 800 AGL, this is straight out of the AFMS, we can turn the autopilot on. So we've powered up, we've pulled the gear up, pulled the flaps up if we had takeoff flaps in, and above 800 AGL, I'm gonna press the AP button on the autopilot, and we're gonna, once again, I press a button on the controller, I'm verifying what I see on my status. So laterally, I'm still showing takeoff, the autopilot and yaw damper automatically are on, my vertical mode's takeoff, I'm still at that climb pitch, and I see ALTS, meaning it's gonna level me out at my selected altitude. Once I'm established in my climb, I'm gonna go ahead and swap over to heading mode. So I hit the heading bug on the autopilot. In this case here, we're starting IAS. I can set hit IAS and it's gonna to peg to whatever airspeed I'm currently doing. I can use that up and down wheel to set my desired climb speed. So if I wanna go at VY, I can look on the G5. I got the V speed flag showing VY. So we're set there. I'm gonna engage heading mode. So now it's gonna start following my heading bug at the top and we're going to verify. So now, heading mode's active on the left, autopilot is on, yaw damper's on, I'm in an IAS, indicated airspeed climb, at 95 knots, and I've got ALTS armed, so it'll level me out at 3000. Exactly what I want the system to do. Next instruction, pretty common out of New Century, Aircraft turn left, heading 090, climb and maintain 7,000. Piece of cake. We're already in a heading mode, so I'm gonna use my heading knob, I'm gonna dial 090 in. The aircraft is automatically gonna start turning to follow that bug. I'm gonna reselect my altitude. So I'm gonna take my altitude knob, I'm gonna reset to 7,000. If the aircraft had already leveled off at three, then I would need to go back, I'd press IAS, use my up and down wheel to set my desired climb speed, and we can continue climbing up. If we made that before, or made that this, uh, altitude change before we had leveled off, then the aircraft is gonna continue climbing at, in this case, 95 knots until we get to 7,000. So it depends on where we are when they get, uh, when we get the clearance. And then, We've changed some buttons, we've, we've moved some knobs around. Once we get done with all that, we're gonna verify our status. We're still in a heading mode up at the top. Autopilot still on, IAS at 95 with altitude select. So we press a button, we verify. Next instruction, proceed direct to Napoleon to Alpha November X-ray, climb and maintain 15,000. Piece of cake. I wanna start with the navigator. I can do this in either order, but this is kind of my preferred method. I wanna set direct to on my navigator. That's gonna reset my CDI. I can see it right there on the G5. Once I've done that, I can press the nav button on the autopilot, and that's gonna automatically start taking me and following that GPS course guidance. I'm gonna reset my altitude bug. So I'm gonna roll my altitude selector this climb up to 15,000. Same thing as before. If we had already leveled off at 7,000, I'll need to uh, hit the IAS button again, reset my climb airspeed, and it'll continue taking me up. If I hadn't gotten to 7,000, if I was still in that climb, simply resetting the altitude bug will allow the aircraft to continue on up to, in this case, 15,000. 
we've made a bunch of changes. I hit direct to, I've re I hit the nav button on the autopilot, I potentially re-engaged IAS for my climb. So what am I gonna need to do? I need to verify. I'm gonna look back up at the top and I'm gonna verify. I hit nav and notice how it says GPS. So it's following that GPS course guidance for me. I've got autopilots are, are on, I've got IAS at 95, ALCS is still armed. So it's gonna take me all the way up. As we get up to altitude, within 200 feet, the autopilot is gonna start transitioning for me. So as we start paying attention to my vertical modes here, as we get with 200 feet, ALTS, altitude target select, is gonna go active, it goes green. And then notice how it automatically armed ALT, altitude hold. I didn't have to tell the system to do it all. I, it knew to do that by me pre-selecting my altitude. And then once we get to 15, then all the other previous modes are going to go ahead and drop off vertically and altitude hold now becomes the active mode, automatically armed. All right, as we're coming in, we get a uh, descent, uh, VNAV descent. So she comes up crossing the coop intersection, descend via the arrival, maintain 7,000. For VNAV, we have a three-step process. The first one is to verify all your altitude constraints in the flight plan. In this case, that would be on your GTN 750. The next step this is where we start up on the autopilot here. So I'm going to roll the altitude to the lowest assign or my lowest cleared altitude. In this case, they told me to maintain 7,000. So I'm going to take my altitude selector. I'm going to roll it down to 7,000. And then I'm going to arm VNAV. Now the GFC 700 had a time restriction or a lot of airframes have a time restriction at five minutes. The GFC 500 does not do that. I can arm VNAV as early as I want prior to top of descent. So we verified our altitude. I've rolled my selector to the lowest altitude. I arm VNAV and I press the button again. So I'm going to verify my modes. We're at altitude hold at 15,000. And I see that VNAV is armed. When I get to the top of my descent, VNAV will become active. One minute prior to the top of your descent, I want to see a VDI, your vertical deviation indicator, and I want to see a vertical speed target appear on my G5. And notice how they are both magenta Vs, V for VNAV. When those center up, then I'm going to notice VNAV is now active. And I'm either going to see ALTV or ALTS. ALTS is, means it's going to level me out at the selected altitude. If I see ALTV, that means it's for somewhere along that VNAV descent, the aircraft needs to level me out. So it's going to level out at the VNAV altitude. But as long as I see those enunciations up there, VNAV is active. I see the altitude select. I know it's going to level me out. So we're gonna make the assumption that we got all the way down to 7,000 with no major issue. So we got all the way down and now we're starting to get into the more of the terminal phase of our flight. We get in closer to St. Louis, ATC comes up and says, send and maintain 3,000. We're not necessarily on a path, a vertical path. They just want us to descend. So I'm gonna start. Anytime I do a climb, I set my altitude first. Anytime I do a descent, I'm gonna set my altitude first. So I take my altitude select, I'm gonna roll that guy down to 3000. And then I'm gonna use the desired vertical mode. In this case, I like using vertical speed for descent. So I'll hit VS, and then I'll use the up and down wheel to set my desired vertical speed. Once I've done that, I'm gonna verify. So we've got vertical speed active. Notice how it's a negative 800. So I wanna come down, in this case, I'm telling it to come down at 800 feet per minute and I've got ALTS armed, meaning it's gonna level me back out at 3000. Now we're starting again, we've loaded up the approach on the navigator. In this case, they're giving us a uh, vector to intercept the final approach course. So they come up, fly heading 090, intercept the final approach course, maintain 3000 until established, cleared for the RNAV 1-2 right approach. So first and foremost, I'm gonna go into heading mode. If I hit the heading bug, or I can, in this case, set my heading 090. I'm gonna engage heading mode. So I hit the heading button on the controller. And I'm gonna verify that heading is active. I see the green heading up there. 
I know it's active. I know it's following my heading bug and not following the nav course. This is a pretty much an industry standard. When ATC clears you for the approach, that's when I'm gonna go ahead and arm approach mode. I hit the APR button on the approach, and now we can verify. I'm gonna verify that I'm on the right CDI source. In this case, I'm on an R nav. So I see my lateral and I see my vertical uh, guidance for the approach starting to come in. I see the magenta, I know I'm on the right course. If this was an ILS, I'd make sure that we're on green needles and we're on VLOC and we can track that. We're also gonna verify our lateral and vertical mode. So notice how I hit approach mode, GPS is white, it's armed. So that's my lateral mode, it wants to follow a GPS lateral course. And I've got GP for glide path, meaning when my VDI, this guy here centers, then glide path will become active and will start taking me down following the approach guidance down. Uh, if you're doing an ILS, you would see probably loc and you would see GS. Loc for localizer, GS for the glide slope. But same principle here. And we're going to follow it on. As everything becomes active, my CDI is starting to center, so GPS became active. I'm still waiting to intercept the glide path, so that glide path is still armed. And now we're on the course, GPS is active, still waiting for the needle to center up for my vertical guidance. And when it does, altitude hold is gonna drop off, and now we're just GPS and GP. It's ignoring our altitude select, it's taking me all the way down at this point. So, Below 200 feet AGL, we're gonna, we have to have the autopilot disengaged. This is straight out of the AFMS again. Once we get to DA, we've got uh, a couple options here. I can either, if I've got my cloud visibility requirements met, I can disengage the autopilot and, and land the aircraft. If I don't have my cloud and vis, then we need to go around. The autopilot makes that a little bit easier for us. So if I'm at DA, I look out, I don't have what I need, I'm gonna hit the toga button. Uh, so when I hit toga, we're gonna to say for the uh, instance of this scenario, we tried to come down, visibility was too low, so we have to go mist. So I'm gonna press the toga button. I'm gonna power up my throttle. I'm gonna pull up the flaps and gear as appropriate. When I hit toga, I'm gonna to expect to see a go around enunciation from a lateral and a go around enunciation for the vertical. Notice how my autopilot is still engaged, it never disengaged. We're still coupled, the servos are still driving. So I hit toga, I powered up, I cleaned up. I'm gonna verify that my missed approach altitude, uh, typically I set that as I'm coming down on the approach. So if I do need to go miss, that's one less thing I have to worry about, but I'm gonna go ahead and verify that my missed approach altitude is in there and it is correct. And then, so I've hit toga, I've powered up, I've cleaned up. Now I'm gonna re-engage nav mode. I hit the nav button on the controller and I can switch back in this case, back to GPS, back to following that nav course. Go around is, very, is a lot like the takeoff mode. It's gonna follow that course, or just gonna keep your wings level. Uh, same thing uh, pitch-wise. It's, it's setting an aircraft climb out pitch. So we powered up, cleaned up. We're gonna re-engage nav so we can fly the rest of that whole, uh, missed approach and get us into the missed approach hold. And then if it's a prolonged climb here, it's gonna take me a little bit to get to 5,000. So I'm gonna go ahead and re-engage IAS and set my specified climb speed and let it continue flying me up to, to my selected altitude. Now we're operating the autopilot just like we did before. We've done a whole lot of different changes, so we're gonna verify. We're verifying that we're in the proper modes and everything is set. And at that point, we get into the missed approach hold, and now we can kind of adjust around a little bit, start talking with air traffic control, figure out what we need to do, what the next approach is, but we'll start working through there. All right, well, that's starting to bring us up to the end of this presentation. Your primary resources, I highly encourage everyone out there, if they are flying out our, our autopilot, to take the time and read through these. Uh, if you're running a G500 or you're running a TXI flight display, there is autopilot information regarding that, so pay attention to those. Same thing for the G3X. 
uh, as well as the G5. And then definitely pay attention, take your time and read through the airframe or the airplane flight manual supplement. That is going to be specific to your aircraft. Take the time to understand it, what it's capable of, what it's not. And it, it is going to be worth a read for you. So as promised, um, if you go to Garmin.com slash GFC500, on there, there is a link for supported aircraft. This is going to tell you what uh, aircraft are currently on the AML, what aircraft are currently in the process of going through uh, its testing, as well as the list of planned aircraft that uh, we're going to start in the next 12 months. So that list is constantly changing. So take a look at that if you're interested to see if your aircraft is on there or if an aircraft is going to be added on there. If you take a look and you realize your aircraft is not on there, then we do have a sign up to request that your aircraft be added to the AML. It's just to fill out that form, it automatically sends in. And there's another one on there if you're willing to loan your aircraft to be used for the certification. They'll have uh, different requirements for there. So, so if you don't see your aircraft on there, there's a couple options there. All right. And as always, please explore. We have more training options at flygarmin.com slash training. We do have a whole slew of webinars coming up here in the next couple months between GTN approaches, VNAV, some Garmin logic approaches, of uh, airborne weather radar, and we even have a follow along. So those with a PC trainer or iPad trainers uh, will do a scenario and let you guys kind of follow along with us and, and get some extra practice working the panel. So I'm going to keep this seminar going here for just a little bit longer, but if you do have any questions that don't get answered here, please email us at aviationtraining.webinar at garmin.com. We want to make sure we get an answer to you. But, but that is taking me up to the end here. I do appreciate you taking your time out this morning and listening to me. Hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about the GFC 500 and what its capabilities are. Uh, but I will keep this going for just a little bit longer. But everybody else, have a safe and wonderful day.